Hey guys, Jim with Crawfordology, uh, where we talk about the things you care about. We got a great show today. We're going to talk about uh, the Kung flu. We're going to talk about partisan politics. We're going to talk about Donald Trump. We're even going to talk about some good news based on uh, some of the, the findings coming out today on COVID-19. So uh, stick with us. We're we going to have a great show for you. Ma'am, we've been tracking. I'm sure everybody is sick to death of hearing the different names for uh, Kung Flu, uh, which I thought, by the way, was hilarious. Kung Flu, I thought, <laughs> that's that's pretty darn good, man. I wish I had thought of Kung Flu. People are giving Donald Trump credit for that, and I don't know if he does you know, pop up with these crazy names. I wouldn't doubt it, like when he's in a closed room with a few folks. So it's really kind of comical. Um, coronavirus. Coronavirus. The Wuhan flu, SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19, whatever it is you're calling it, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. There, there's actually a couple of uh, silver linings I think that come with uh, with the sequestration we have. You know, I'm I'm here in the ultra clean studio still with Simon. We still have our sanitizer. We still have social distancing. Plenty of room between us, so we're practicing, uh, you know, safe podcasting. Um, but you know, one of the cool things that I noticed this week, and and actually for my, for for one of my companies, we're going to have a mixer on uh, on Tuesday, and we're really looking forward to this because it is a uh, it's a virtual happy hour. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to laugh a little bit about where we are. We're going to look at the fact that we're working remotely. We're not seeing people as frequently. Uh, a friend of mine who who has a company gave me the idea of doing this, and I said, "Yeah, that's a great idea. We're we're going to do it too." Um, so, but there are some positives that have kind of come from this too. I, you know, I've spent a lot more time with my family over the last several days. Uh, had more time to have conversations. Had more time to just kind of slow down. Had time to do some projects around the house. Not too many, but I'm getting started, right? We, we could have weeks, right? We got weeks to go, so, so plan now. Um, so that slower pace, and, and you know, as somebody who used to work from home, I can tell you it's not like it's easier. You tend to work a lot more hours from home than you do when you're at the office because you just forget you're working. Um, I could get up in the morning and be, and be right at the same seat, you know, 12, 13 hours later, Realizing that all I've done is, you know, gotten up to, to eat, go to the bathroom, come back, take a phone call, working on something. So, so it's really, you know, there's some, there's some productivity enhancements that can come out of this type of work. And with what we have today in terms of uh, video and, and access to work remotely, to, to share information with folks, you know, m most, most people I know are using Office 365, maybe Google Docs. But you're able to actually have a conversation just like you're there. We have people already that live and work for us all over the country, all over the world. So this is just another day. Our headquarters element doesn't show up at the office, but we still get the same things done. So one of the things that I think is really cool about a time like this is you really have a chance to consider your place in world history, right? In eternity and contemplate your, moral your, your mortality think, you know, what does this really mean for me? And some of you are doing it out of fear. Some of you are doing it out of boredom. Some of you maybe aren't doing it yet. But this is a good time to do that, to, to really think, you know, what, what should I be doing? What am I, am I on the right track? Should I, should I be doing something totally different? And it looks like in a case like this, we're going to have plenty of time to think. So um, there's also some unifying news. I, I, I mean, if you've watched, um, who would have thought we would have heard uh, Governor Cuomo or Newsom say nice things about Donald Trump? You know, the governor of New York and the governor of California saying nice things about Donald Trump. I'm shocked. Who would have thought they would have heard the president saying nice things about Senator Feinstein, right? But I've heard both in just the last couple of days. So, so one of the things we might be moving towards is a little bit of unity, a little bit of uh, let's defeat this virus. Look, <laughs> I wish I could say it would last. At 9-11, you can remember we had a similar feeling. 
everybody unified on 912 and and for the next couple of years but uh you know these things will fade but right now we've got that moment where everybody's tackling the the, the virus uh, you know where there's some exceptions but generally speaking we're focused on solving a problem and and i think that's good there's a big economic act impact um of course unemployment's going to go sky high uh small businesses i i in a forum with a bunch of small businesses and i hear uh some of the stress and strain already worries about uh you know reduction and and workload canceled contracts liquidity crunches so you know people can't do the work they can't get the money in they're not going to be able to pay payroll they're not going to be able to pay bills so be patient you know be patient with your folks be patient with your vendors if uh if you're somebody who's owed a lot of money be patient right this is a tough time everybody's trying to figure it out um, I understand that the president's putting somewhere near two trillion dollars towards this uh, this bailout, uh, and bailout's probably not the right word. It should be sort of an emergency funding package because this is really an extraordinary. I would not typically support this type of deal, but this is so extraordinary that uh, we've got to have a way to to navigate the space and get on the other side of uh, the virus. And see what happens. So, so hang in there. You know, things are things are happening. Um, look, we're Americans, right? We are independent thinkers. We've got grit. We are the folks who settled this land. We tamed the West. We we did a lot of crazy things. I mean, look at the boats. If you ever want to see the small boats that these guys came across the Atlantic in and landed here in Jamestown, you'll just think they could only get crazy people to do that anyway, right? It, it's, it just doesn't even seem like a good idea. But they came here, and they forged this country with that pioneer spirit, with that idea that, man, there's something out here, and we're supposed to do it. And that's the way we've got to keep our focus. We're entrepreneurial. We're, we're, we've really got a lot of fortitude. We've got a, a spirit in America that you can't find anywhere else in the world. So let's get our acts together, let's put our heads together, and let's start thinking about how we do things proactively. If this is the new norm, even if it's just for the next three to eight weeks, let's figure out how to get things done even when we have to do it remotely, okay? Let's, let's, uh, let's jump on that. So <clears throat> the president took a lot of criticism this past week about uh, Kung Flu. Um, and, and I think one of the reporters said, uh, hey, isn't that racist that you're, uh, you're saying that this is the, the China flu and, and so on? Um, a couple things that were kind of interesting to me is China is not a race, right? Uh, if you were to look at <laughs> any of the, the EEO forms or, or those, uh, those different types of forms that you fill out where you have to mark your race, China is not one that pops up, right? Asian, I think, is a race. China is a nationality, so or Chinese is a nationality. Um, so it's really not racist in, in, in that way alone. Plus, what about the Chinese bird flu and the Chinese swine flu? Those weren't racist. Those were also Chinese flus. What about the Spanish flu? In fact, the same network that was talking about that being the China flu being racist, 30 seconds later talked about the Spanish flu, which I thought was really comical. So sometimes, you know, the president's in a no-win situation. He couldn't say anything right. No one would be happy with it no matter what he did, right? He could come in and he could, uh, he could have all the answers. He could have it all worked out. But there would be somebody who just wasn't happy. I, I like to say if the president created a machine that was printing $100 bills and giving them out for free, There'd be somebody who would say, well, I really wanted 250s, right? I wasn't really happy with a $100 bill. So, so we have this sense of fear. You can hear it in some people's voices. Uh, some of it's the isolation. I think we get concerned when, when the government's telling us to isolate. And we have this, uh, this real anxiety over what's going to happen to us, what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my loved ones. And I'm sure you hear all the things that, uh, that give you concern, weakened immune systems. Um, it, you know, if you've, if you've gone through any major 
surgery, any any major something that has reduced your immune system, uh, you got some concern. And and people probably have even more concern when they hear the percentages ar around the the deaths. And of course, the media loves to throw gasoline on that and just tell you how bad it is or how bad it's going to be. Uh, and we're going to talk about that later in the show. Uh, but I just want to talk about for a second, I, I like to sometimes think about things in the worst case. So what is the worst case? And of course, to many of us, death would be the worst case. In, uh, in the 1800s, there was a, uh, a day named, named Siren Kierkegaard. And he wrote a book called Fear and Trembling. And, you know, in the book, and it was translated in about 1910. He wrote the book in 1843. In 1910, it was, it was uh, translated into English. And the book is about how you should look at your salvation at, with fear and trembling, right? You should be figuring that out first and foremost. It should be the most important thing in your life, because you really don't know. Forget Kung Flu, forget COVID-19, you know, anything at any moment, and if you just pause for a minute and think about it, how many times have you heard about a terrible accident? Have you heard about something that was just so unusual that's caused the death of someone that you didn't expect, right? That could happen to you or any of your loved ones, right? So think about focusing at least first, maybe to get through the problem. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but, but think about what would happen, worst case. Um, you know, not, not about just what happens if, um, if, if I die, you know, financially, but what really happens to us after we die. Think about those deeper things and think about what that means to you. Um, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and then live your life, right? Because you could get struck by lightning. You could get uh, caught up in a Sharknado. I saw it. It happened. It, there's a movie about it, right? I mean, there are terrible things that people can dream up that can happen to us. So take a moment, maybe every morning, to just kind of settle yourself and say, what's the worst thing that could happen? And as long as you've got that covered, then everything else is upside, right? So this uh, Saturday's Wall Street Journal had a, um, a, an article uh, written by Zach Carbell um, titled, The End of Globalization, Don't Count on It. And, um, and this was really interesting to me because, and, and basically what they're saying is, hey, is COVID-19 bringing an end to the world as we knew it three weeks ago or three months ago? And he makes a point uh, to say that, you know, people are really second guessing, will the world remain connected? Uh, will we lose way to nationalism? Uh, will, there, will there be all of these little kingdoms again that you know, choose not to communicate or work together. Um, globalists hate the ideas of walls, regulations. Any vestige of nationalism is really repulsive to, to these folks, right? So the idea that Donald Trump wants to put a border wall between us and Mexico and force immigrants to come through the door as opposed to slip across the border really drives him crazy, right? Or really drives them crazy. Um, but, you know, if we really think about it, the things that they're talking about in this article, um, are, are we going to remain connected after, after this? Of course we are. We're communicating now. We're, we're still doing trade. We're still doing all these, all these crazy things. And I think people like to push the envelope when it comes to, are we out of our minds? Are we, are we going to lock the front door and the back door and not let anybody in? Are we pulling everybody home? We're never going to be traveling abroad? Of course not. Um, I think the issue, if there's any issue right now, it's state transparency and, and is certainly in question. Um, the Chai Coms, the Ruskies, right, they have a social media presence that is trying to disrupt 
here in the U.S. They're trying to create uncertainty. They're trying to lower the level of confidence in the American people. Uh, they put out misinformation. You know, the the president's going to put the U.S. on lockdown. The National Guard's coming out not to help you, but they're coming out to imprison you, right? Now, if you really think about that for a minute, we don't operate that way. Uh, we, we may say shelter in place, and here's why it's important to do. We may push the envelope on things like that, but do they really grab you off the street if they see you? I haven't seen it yet. I mean, we, we happen to operate here on the East Coast. There are hurricane warnings. There are mandatory evacuations almost every hurricane season. And then the news goes around all the houses that are still occupied or having hurricane parties to interview the people and see what they have to say. The police or, you know, there are no jackbooted thugs that are coming to drag them out of their house and lock them in to the hospital. But you can see some of that that happened in China. You can see people being drugged into the hospitals of no return in China. So when we think about having a transparency that, that gets, you know, really a communication from our government to our people, the president is out there every day for an hour or more with all of those advisors, and he's talking to us. And I think I take him at, his, at face value. He's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to make us believe something that isn't true. He's giving us a daily briefing because he wants us to have up-to-date information. Um, the idea that the Chinese and the Russians and probably some of the other state actors who just like to meddle in our business, Iran, North Korea, putting out stuff because it's kind of fun to just stir the pot, watch this, terrible. That's the sort of thing we have to deal with. There's an abundance of these social media panic stories. You can pay attention to those if you want, but I really recommend <laughs> that you get your news from a more credible source. If you want to know about uh, COVID-19, Kung Flu, any of the up-to-date information, uh, we're going to put some stuff up on the Crawfordology.com. We invite you to go there daily. All we're doing is linking to the CDC, to the World Health Organization, and to some other reliable places so that you can see, one, their suggestions, their suggestions for you, their suggestions for your pets. There are things that... Uh, I was really surprised that, you know, this, uh, although they don't have any evidence yet that this is, uh, can be transferred to your pet, many of these other viruses can. So they make recommendations. Don't, don't deal with your pet if you're sick or if you're, if you're showing any of the symptoms. If you have somebody else who can take care of the pet, do that. Uh, because the pet may be able to get uh, the flu just like you. But I encourage you to go. We're, we're going to put a link here. In fact, I think we're going to show you a page show you what the page looks like, and then show you how to get there. You know, if, if you just look at that, get, get some information there. You know, another couple of thoughts on the Chinese. Um, let's just think about our supply chain and how happy we are getting everything that we need in America made in China. Because if you were really tracking the story at the beginning of this flu, you know, China has to date something like 81,416 um, people infected with the, the Wuhan flu, the Kung flu. Um, at some point, they decided to turn some ships around that were headed to the U.S. And, and other places because they had medical supplies. And we really have to think about that. Is, is that where we want strategically our resources to come from? I'm, I'm sure that some could come from there. But do we not need to have these sorts of things still being manufactured at home where we can get our hands on them quickly, where we can ramp up quickly? We'll talk about uh, some of the logistics issues later in the show. But uh, I just, I just want to say, I mean, this is a problem for us. Um, you know, we've actually gone out on the street in China. We've got a uh, concerned citizen. And, um, well, you know, let's just roll the clip. And uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about... Uh, Donald Trump and China. Have you seen Donald Trump? Do you think he should step in? Donald Trump don't trust China. China is asshole. So if that's what you're looking for, if you are looking for more of that, we want to hear about it in the comments. If you think we should get everything from China, 
please comment. If you think we shouldn't, comment. We, we want to hear your thoughts. Should we be, you know, working with other partners in the region, uh, Mexico, Canada, here in North America, our, our other allies, are there other places we should be teaming up with? Or should we just be doing it here, at least to some level, so we're able to do it here in the U.S.? Um, so, so back to the, the bigger idea of globalization, you know, as a result of, uh, of the latest NAFTA uh, renegotiation, and, and this is Donald Trump's replacement for NAFTA, really. Uh, Mexico is now our number one trading partner. And I thought this was really interesting. Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, Mexico's south of our border. We, we cover a lot of, lot of border together with Mexico. Um, the greatest number of, of illegal border penetrations come from Mexico. Opportunities in Mexico probably help lower that stress on the border in Mexico. If I have jobs in Mexico, there's no need to run north of the border. There's, there's some of that. Um, Mexico's in our hemisphere. I can think of lots of good reasons here that we want to work with the Mexican government. Um, I want to see the North American economy really stable and strong. Canada, the U.S., Mexico really plugged in together, and we could do a whole lot right here. Think of the efficiencies, the, the shipping costs we save, transportation time. There's just a lot of things that could happen right here. Um, you know, China halts our shipments, critical medical supplies, ensure they had what they needed. Why would we allow shortages here in the U.S.? to build their middle class, right? Why do we want to build th their economy stronger at the cost of our economy and the cost of our people in times of crisis? And, um, well, you know, he said it. Donald Trump don't trust China. China is asshole. So, you know, globalization isn't going to end. Um, and that's a good thing. Communication is way easier than 40 years ago. Um, just this morning, I communicated... Uh, via text and email with people in Europe, with people in South America, with people in Asia. And, you know, other than the fact that uh, I know where they are, very easy, right? It's not like we had to get on a ship and go for 30 days to, uh, to, to take the news over to Asia or to Europe. So I think this is, is really unlikely. Uh, nice article because it does make some really good points about about these things that are of concern, but also comes to the same conclusion I have. Hey, it's just not likely to end. Uh, we're connected in ways like we've never been. We we many of us have friends in these countries. Many of us live abroad. Um, so the expatriates of the U.S. that are that are living in places, teaching English as a second language working jobs in other countries, working for other U.S. companies, working for other foreign companies. There's just a lot more of that today than there ever has been before, and that's, that's really a great thing. Um, so uh, the choice isn't globalize or go to war, right? We're not, we're not left with just two choices, that if we don't globalize, we're immediately building walls and going to war against one another. I think what we are in need of, what we want, and what we have the right to expect is that partners deal with us openly and honestly uh, with transparency, right? And we're going to talk later in the show about China and how they handled the, the Wuhan flu, uh, how they lowered estimates or refused to give information, and we've got the timeline on that, so we'll talk about that uh, coming up. And, and, and really, kind of a nice segue here is in to talk a little bit about the president. Um, so I've heard for a while, you know, people are, are really hard on the president, and I've mentioned it here. Um, it, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me uh, that we expect the president to have perfect information just because he's the president. Um, yeah, he's got a great intelligence network. He's got, he's got people out there bringing stuff back to him all the time. But if you think for one second that they come back to him with a unanimous opinion as to what he should do or even what the information means, you know, you're fooling yourself. There are lots of different equities being worked in those rooms, 
lots of different opinions going around from equally intelligent people. So if you're the president, you have to make really hard choices fast, and you really are relying on, despite a lot of folks say Donald Trump doesn't use his, his advisors, I think he uses his advisors, but I think he also recognizes that we have had pretty much status quo for the last 40 years, and he probably looks at that and says, hey, if they had all the answers, wouldn't we be making more traction on these things? And I think if I look at the result of what he's done leading up to now, he's definitely had traction. Two major trade deals in the first couple of years, couple, three years of his, of his first term, despite a Congress that was totally pushing back and fighting against him at every step of the way. So I absolutely love that uh, there's a way to deal with that and that, uh, that you know, he's pushed out some really, some really good stuff. Um, so if you were following the press conferences this week, um, there is a particular press conference where uh, Peter Alexander of NBC asked the question, what do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? And here's the clip. What do you say to the Americans who are scared, though? I guess nearly 200 dead. 14,000 who are sick, millions, as you witness, who are scared right now. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. Right. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. The American people are looking for answers, and they're looking for hope. And you're doing sensationalism. And uh, the same with NBC and Comcast. So I don't call it, I don't call it Comcast, I call it Comcast. Let me just ask for whom you work. Let me just say something. That's really bad reporting. And you ought to get back to reporting instead of sensationalism. Let's see if it works. It might and it might not. I happen to feel good about it, but who knows? I've been right a lot. Let's see what happens, John. Can I come back from science and religion? I don't know Peter Alexander, and I don't know his intent, but just knowing that generally the m mainstream media is looking to, um, you know, throw out barbs at the president at, at the very least, uh, sharp edges, not not softballs. Some people I've seen say that uh, this was all about a softball, but I don't think that's true. I think it was really a gotcha question. And I love the way the president answers simply to say, hey, I'm telling you, we have a plan. We have a way to move forward. And you keep trying to come back into that fear, right? So there's really nothing for us to be afraid of. We just have to keep pushing forward with solutions. And we try one. And if it doesn't work, we try another one. And if it doesn't work, we try another one. And another one, a thousand times later, another one. So. I, I love one of the things I like about Donald Trump is that when he wants to come back at someone, he does it very quickly. He's very curt about it. It's sharp, and it was it was kind of over. But really, I like that that he was leading in that moment to say, "Hey, I'm not getting into the fear. Let's get into we've got solutions. Let's not even bring up the fear." Because I bet he could see what that headline was going to look like and what the, the five-minute lead-in about scared America and then the three-second soundbite that they were going to play for Donald Trump would be the worst three seconds of whatever he said. So I appreciate that. I, I, I love that. I think that it's unreasonable in some of the criticism. I, I've mentioned it in this podcast today and before. Um, if you look at the timeline for uh, Kung Flu, you can, you can see the president started talking about this, I think, initially. The first was uh, back in December as, uh, as, as that first, and, it, and at the very end of December, um, the first case showed up in China on December 27th. Uh, China denied that COVID-19 is spreading on December 31st. They said, hey, we don't, there's no problem. Uh, when they notified the uh, well, they actually had this guy notify the WHO of the flu. Donald Trump, don't trust China. China is asshole. China comes in and says, um, hey, we might have a problem. 
Um, this is a human to human transmission rather than livestock, right? It's, it's not livestock spreading this, it's human to human. Now, they kept that information silent. So one of the things I like to look at is what information did Donald Trump have to work from? So if you're talking president to president and the president says, hey, hey man, there's really nothing to worry about. We got this thing, you know, here's what you need to do. Uh, it's under control. It's very minimal. You know, it's not a big deal. Uh, I've got it. I've got it worked out here in China. And then suddenly three weeks later, well, maybe not. Maybe it's not so easy. And on January 20th, when they admit that it's, it's spread by humans, January 21st, the CDC in the United States confirms the first U.S. case. Okay? So very quickly, as soon as they confirm with World Health Organization, we have the very next day the first case in the U.S. On January 23rd, China locks down Wuhan and three other cities. So three weeks after the fact, China locks down and does the sequestration. Now, they're a totalitarian government, right? They do things, unlike us, when we say, hey, it's time to leave for the hurricane. If in China you don't leave when they say leave, they do drag you out of your house. And you may not get to go where you want to go, but you know you better listen when they say do something. Uh, there's plenty of, I mean, you don't have to Google a whole lot. Google uh, Chinese house churches. You can see that's something they've outlawed, right? Look at uh, the, uh, the Muslim pop population in China. I mean, Google's working with them to create facial recognition so they can find all those folks based on, based on their, their physical appearance. Um, so, so China takes these things really seriously. They lock down three cities. And, and then on January 22nd, day before they lock it down, um, President Trump is in a press conference and says, hey, we have this under control. Right, we, We've only got one case. It's the day after the first case in the U.S. So if I'm the president, the CDC says, hey, we've got a case. We've got this guy. You know, We've isolated him. We've got it under control. I think that's a rational thought on day one when your experts are saying we have it under control. And as a leader, when you're coming out to speak to the American people, that you would say something like, hey, don't worry about it. We've got it under control. We're, you're going to instill that confidence. You want your your constituency to believe that your leadership has them safe. So absolutely no problem from my point of view and probably a very rational response. It's one case, and he says, I've got it under control. January 29th, he required quarantine. So anybody who had that that uh, signs of, of Wuhan flu, they had to um, to be quarantined. So I, I don't know. I think that's really rational. That doesn't seem like that's awkward. It doesn't seem like it's disingenuous. He's not trying to lie or hide anything. Um, and then two days later, so, so we're 10 days from the CDC confirming the first case in the U.S. On the 31st of January, he issues the Chinese travel ban. Now, I want you to think what has to happen to do that. Right, I'm a, I imagine there's some pretty serious phone calls and conversations with the president of China. I imagine there's some pretty serious conversations with the economic advisors, with Department of State, with the military to talk about what does this mean? What are the implications if I make this travel ban to all of you? We still don't have a good picture of what Wuhan flu, what Kung flu looks like. We just know that there's an issue and that it's serious. So I think that it's unreasonable to be critical, certainly through January 31st. On February 2nd, he comes out and says, hey, we pretty much shut it down. So I believe at that point he still would have thought this is where we are. We pretty much have this under control. We had a case. We've quarantined the case. Anybody who has that he's been in contact with is going to be quarantined, and we're going to have control over these cases in the U.S. So on February 15th, a national emergency is declared. So 15 days from the travel ban, 
he's, he's got a national emergency declared. By the 26th, he has uh, made Vice President Pence the Wuhan flu man, the Corona Junta, right? The COVID-19 czar. He's the guy in charge. Now, people were critical of that. And I thought, why would you be critical of him putting the vice president, his number two guy, in charge of managing? So that's the executive level sponsorship. I, if somebody's critical because they think that the vice president's out there in the lab, like trying to come up with the cure, I think that's ridiculous. If they think that the vice president's getting on the phone and making all the phone calls, also ridiculous. But when you need somebody to call to say, I need to move a mountain right now, and I need somebody who can apply some pressure here, somebody who's got enough uh, gravitas that they'll be taken seriously when they pick up the phone, uh, Mr. Vice President, can you call the CEO of General Motors? Right. I think that's also a good and reasonable response. And a good use of Mike Pence, who's a seasoned Washington operative. He was the governor of Indiana. He's been in Congress. So here's a guy who knows how Washington works. He's, he's smooth and he's smart and he's dealt with similar, although not pandemic sized things, but he's dealt with some similar things in Indiana as governor. So he's got that executive experience. He's got the Washington DC experience and he's the vice president. And, and he and the president seem to be pretty linked, right? They seem to be pretty connected. So three days after that, we see that because of the migration of, of Chinese travelers going into Europe and Italy, we see the spike in Italy. And three days after that, he creates the travel ban from Italy, Iran, and South Korea. So he adds those three additional countries within three days. I think also smart moves. He left the UK open at that point because there's probably a, a little special relationship with the UK, both in terms of the number of Americans that are in the UK, as well as in terms of, of the things that we do together. Um, the, UA, the UK opted for a let's let this thing play its course approach, right? We're not going to isolate. We're not going to lock people down. We're just going to do what we do. And we'll talk about that a little bit later and what the potential impacts are. Um, March 11th, travel ban for the rest of Europe, including UK, right? They all come back in. And then March 21st today, um, 793 dead yesterday in, in Italy. 6,557 new cases in Italy, a total now of 53,578 cases. 943 fully recovered. So I think there's some, some things to talk about there. Um, you know, a president, like any leader, has to war game scenarios, outcomes. He's got to have a, a plan for the worst case, the best case, and the likely case. He's got he's to be very fluid in decision making as information improves. And this information wasn't flowing freely, either from China or in, in some cases just because it wasn't known. It's a new disease. So there's a lot of, of Monday morning quarterbacking that's going on right now with the president. And I have to say, I am pretty daggone proud of, of the job that he's been doing, including the job that the Democrats have been doing with him to come together and to work side by side and, and resolve this problem and, and, and solve the issue. Uh, there's a pretty big package that's being put out You know, a, a week or two ago. I would have said, no, that's terrible. That's a terrible idea. But this size and scale, the magnitude of this problem is so big that it's hard not to take that and accept it as we, we've got to dip into the nation's coffers for this emergency to get past it. And then we'll figure out how we're going to build our, ways, our, our way out of it, right? How we're going to pay this, this off. Um, we can't have you know, every sector in the United States closed. We can't have every sector in the United States going bankrupt because of, of a liquidity crisis or uh, lack of cash to pay bills and, and to, to pay loans. Um, I think there's almost got to be a pause button pressed on, on the side of the banks, uh, the lenders as well as the lindies <laughs> to say, hey, we need a minute to get this figured out before we resume payments. And, and 
all things will be made right in the end. We just can't rush to uh, to to hurt folks going through this this time. A lot of small businesses. We are you know the small businesses really make the country run. Uh, they employ far more people than the large companies, and they're much more nimble and responsive. They're they're much more capable of responding to a crisis or a change in the economic climate than those big companies that have a lot of corporate governance, have a lot of leadership, have a long decision making process. Um, so we've got to we've got to give them some some leeway here to operate and a chance to come back. But with the president, look, give him a break. He's, uh, he's doing everything humanly possible. He's having a meeting with the American people through that press conference every day. And you can see around him all of the experts, the folks who, who know what they're talking about, the scientists, the doctors, uh, the, the first responders. And I, I think that's really a great transparent way of communicating. People are asking questions, and in real time he's saying, hey, how about you take that one? And, and you're hearing the answer in real time. So give the guy a break, and, uh, and, and let's all pull together here. It's frustrating. I, I get it. I mean, I know it's hard to set at home. Um, go back to the first couple of minutes of this podcast. <laughs> Spend time with your family. Play a game. Think about life. Contemplate the world. Uh, do something besides think about how crappy the president is. Let's get through this problem. Let's solve the issues and, and let's work together to get the economy back rolling. But there are some bright spots for the U.S., um, and, and I want to share those with you uh, before we close out. So I, I've been on a number of calls this past week with, uh, with our business, and we've, we've talked to folks from uh, big think tanks, uh, big medical research, uh, big medical providers, as well as uh, the financial industry. Um, MIT has put out some stuff. Johns Hopkins has put out some stuff. Of course, the CDC and World Health Organization are putting out a lot of information in real time. Again, go to thecrawfordology.com. You can find that information up there. It's for you. It's so you don't have to rely on Ed, the guy who sends you notes from Facebook, telling you that the sky is falling, right? You can actually see the stuff in real time. There's a daily report on the CDC. It tracks every single country. You can see the number of total cases, new cases. You can see the number of deaths, the number of new deaths. And you can see the number of, of folks who have, uh, who have totally recovered. So that'll give you a little better understanding of the numbers. Um, if I didn't say it before, I'm going to say it here, uh, a little bit out of place. But when you hear these death numbers, you know, they're terrifying, right? They sound... They sound terrible, um, but the truth be told, we're getting death numbers without totally knowing the number of people infected. Some of the folks, there was a, a, a reporter uh, this past week that interviewed some recovered people, and they said, man, we didn't even know we had it until I got a little headache and a little fever. And then they tested me because I was at a party where some other people had it, and it turned out 14 of the people from the party had it. All 14 recovered. And the gal who was on the interview said, I didn't even know it. And in fact, check out this clip. In the morning and I felt ill. I was a little bit tired, but I thought that perhaps I had just overdone it the previous weekend and been out. So I went to the office like usual. Um, but in the midday, I started feeling worse. I had a bad headache. I had body aches. Um, you know, I felt tired. So I also felt a little... Uh, feverish, so I did go home. I worked from home, and that evening I took a, a nap in the early evening. When I woke up, my temperature was 101 degrees Fahrenheit, and then by the time I went to go to bed, my temperature was 103 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's around 39.4 uh, degrees Celsius. So it was quite high. Um, at that point, I got ready for bed. I took some over-the-counter medicine. I took some acetaminophen, which in the United States is branded as uh, Tylenol. And then I went to bed um, the next morning. Thankfully, my fever had come down by 2 degrees to 101 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the real critical issue on, on deaths, um, I said there's a bright spot, and we're going to talk about deaths some more, um, is the beds. It's the beds that are available for critical care, the ICU beds. It's the pumps. It's all the things. So it's not just the bed. It's it's the stuff that goes with that. It's the health care that goes with a, uh, a critical care unit. 
if uh, if if you look at the statistics, I mean, they're going to just really blow you away, and, and I'm going to share those with you. When we look specifically at the deaths in uh, Wuhan province, 3,261 out of 81,416 people infected. Um, you know, it, it looks like a big number. However, we've got to look that uh, Wuhan is not really a good comparison of the U.S. One, the health of the people in Wuhan is very poor. Many of these folks are smokers. Uh, in fact, I think they say almost every male smokes. The um, industrial uh, air quality, it's, it's an industrial area, not a big EPA presence there, right? So all of the stuff that's going into production is just rolling out in China, and the people are breathing it in. So their lungs already have some issues, and then a little more issue uh, with add, add the smoking. And then add the fact that this is a respiratory illness. So, you know, you've got sort of the trifecta of problems right there. So outcomes are going to be a lot poorer in that region than they would be here. Um, but back to those, those beds. So China has about 3.6 beds per 100,000 people, critical care beds. 3.6. Um, you know, really a low number. Italy has 12 and a half beds per 100,000. South Korea, who you saw, by the way, South Korea got right on this. They locked things down. Very disciplined society in South Korea. Um, and, and, and I think it's the difference between, you know, that American grit and spirit I talked about makes us a little bit rebellious. Uh, I lived in South Korea for about 18 months. I just visited not, not too long ago um, before the Wuhan flu was there. Uh, and it's still just a very, a, a very strict, people follow the rules in South Korea. So if the government says, hey, don't go out, isolate, people don't go out, they isolate. I'm sure there are exceptions, but generally speaking, that's the deal. So they've got 10.6 beds in critical care compared for every 100,000. Germany is the closest to the U.S., right? So if you look at Germany and you see what, uh, what they're doing, they have 29.2 uh, beds per 100,000. And the United States has 34.7. So we have a lot of capacity. And when we hear people talking about this curve, part of the reason to isolate, part of the reason for this social distancing, uh, new term, that's cool, um, is to make sure that we keep those critical care folks below the curve, below that 34.7 beds that we need so that we don't overstress the healthcare system like you see in Italy. You've heard some things going on in Italy um, that they're ha having to actually choose who's getting a respirator and who's not. There's just not enough respirators to go around. So I want you to think about, uh, you know, there's a very positive sign here. You may not like being locked in your house. I know today New York, California, New Jersey, they've issued some, um, some mandatory sort of, sort of quarantining, uh, stay at home or shelter in place rules. We need to follow those rules. I know they're frustrating. I know we want to get the businesses rolling. We got to figure out a new way to do that for, for right now. That's hard if you're a, a manufacturer and your plant is, you know, 15 miles away and you can't get there. I, I get that. But there are other folks who are working in services. There are other folks who do things that they can still do from home. You know, we've got to make sure that we're all putting our shoulder to the wheel here and, and pushing ahead with this. Um, in terms of numbers, this is something that was great that I heard. What we're looking for is, is where China is right now. So China, as of yesterday, reported 116 new cases. Uh, this is on the CDC website. 116 new cases. And uh, I don't have the number in front of me, but they have several hundred people who have recovered fully. Um, I, I, I want to say, well, I'm not going to say. It would just be a, it would be a guess. But uh, it's a significant number. So when we see those sorts of things happening, when the number of new cases is lower than the number of people who have fully recovered, that's when we know we've turned the corner and that 
that is starting to go the other way. We've kind of reached the, the peak. Now, some people speculate that as China, it, Wuhan is back open for business, right? They closed all those surge hospitals. People are back doing their thing. And we're going to see what happens if there's a whole nother round of contact uh, virus growth that, that goes because you've got one or two people who they didn't get. They didn't know, you know, that uh, this one or that one was actually uh, a carrier, and we find that it spreads a little bit more. But if it does, I'm sure we're going to go through this cycle a couple more times. There's some, some really uh, interesting things happening in terms of uh, creative medicine. I hear a number of things that are just being, you know, sent through like a rocket ship for approvals to get testing. We're still probably looking at 18 months to have a real solid solution uh, for the virus. So we've got to go through another season. The weather. So I want to point out uh, MIT and Johns Hopkins had this really good piece. And I'm sorry to wait till the end of the, the video here to talk about this, but I think this is really exciting. The weather is, so as the warm weather comes in, it appears right now this thing grows best when it's between 3 and 13 degrees centigrade. Um, the, uh, the deal is once we get over 64 degrees, according to Johns Hopkins, they think this thing is going to significantly slow, stall out. Um, and we're close. We're close. You know, parts of the South yesterday were in the 80s. New York City, I think, was in the 70s yesterday. Now, I know we've got a cold front coming through. But hang in there. It's, we are, we are going to get through this. It's going to be terrible because we got to watch the news, and they like to make it as bad as they can make it every single day. So I'm sorry for that, but let's just like push on. We're going to drive through. We're going to make it. I want to hear your comments. I want to know what you're concerned about when it comes to the flu, when it comes to your business, when it comes to anything. Put it in the comments. Send us a note. Uh, send us an email. Uh, don't forget to go back to the Crawfordology on the Crawfordology.com, you'll find this information. It changes every day. It's in real time. So you can find really good information, really good insights. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, go there and, and, and see what's happening. And, of course, if you haven't already, go to YouTube. Like our, our page. Make sure that you follow us. So like, follow, hit all the little dots, all the bells and whistles. And then uh, go back over on Facebook and on Instagram and find us there. All right, take care of yourself, and we'll see you next time.